Next, a House Government Reform Subcommittee hearing on telecommuting. On Thursday, the subcommittee heard testimony on public and private approaches to letting employees work either from home or at a site other than their regular office, utilizing the Internet and other technologies. This hearing is chaired by Congressman Tom Davis of Virginia. It's about an hour, 40 minutes. Yes, that's true. Good morning. Welcome to the subcommittee's second oversight hearing on federal telecommuting. The telework initiative gives employees the flexibility to work outside the traditional workplace, generally at home uh, or in telecenters. Today, we're going to evaluate the progress of the federal government agency's efforts to promote the initiative. We will also review agency's compliance with Section 359 of Public Law 106-346, the fiscal year 2001 Department of Transportation Appropriation Bill. I want to take a moment to thank uh, Congresswoman Connie Morella, Congresswoman Shelley Moore Capito, Congressman Jim Moran, Delegate Eleanor Holmes Norton for joining us this morning. Uh, Congressman Frank Wolf wanted to be here today, but he was called uh, to the White House uh, this morning. As many of you know, uh, Mr. Wolf has been a longtime supporter of telework and is responsible for the inclusion of Section 359 in last year's Transportation Appropriations Bill. This year, he introduced H.R. 1012, the Telework Tax Initiative Act, uh, which would provide a tax credit to eligible telecommuters. Advances in computer and telecommunications technology have facilitated the rapid growth of telework in the private sector. While companies enjoy increased productivity, job satisfaction, and employee morale as a result of telework programs, the federal government's success has been inconsistent. Over the past decade, there have been executive plans to encourage federal telecommuting, but a more formalized plan with comprehensive guidelines was never introduced. Section 359 in the related conference report language strived to change that. Section 359 directs federal agencies to establish telework policies as a means to ease congestion and permit 25 percent of their eligible workforce to telecommute by April 23, 2001. An additional 25 percent must be permitted to telecommute each year over the next three years. The conference report requires OPM to assess the effectiveness of the program and to report to Congress. Our March 22nd hearing revealed that if telecommuting is used strategically, it can be an effective recruitment and retention tool in the federal workplace. For example, an aggressive telecommuting policy may help the federal government address the shortage of information technology workers. As the federal IT workforce nears retirement eligibility, they may be enticed back to the federal workforce on flexible terms, while taxpayers benefit from a knowledgeable and experienced workforce. In fact, a December 2000 survey conducted by the Merit Systems Protection Board found a possible correlation between the availability of telecommuting and federal employees' intention to leave federal service. The March hearing also helped identify some of the key barriers to federal telecommuting, including the availability of computer and telecommunications equipment, managerial attitudes, funding, and insufficient marketing and education about the concept. In fact, some federal employees still report confusion about their agency's policies, and some don't even know if teleworking is an option for them. Furthermore, federal managers in particular are resistant to telework because they are no longer in a position to monitor employees directly. Thus, managers need to shift their focus from process-oriented performance uh, measurements to results. But the federal workplace culture will not change overnight. It's a long and gradual process. That's why I'm pleased that OPM and GSA have already made concerted efforts to promote telework and address these persistent concerns. In addition to training sessions for employees, managers, and top-level officials, OPM partnered with GSA to create a one-stop telework website to educate the workforce and provide a variety of resources about telework, including links to agency policies, sample telework agreements, telecenter information, OPM guidance, and OPM's uh, study highlighting agency success stories. OPM's recent interim report on telework in the federal government indicates that the barriers I mentioned still inhibit uh, telework. They still inhibit telework. For the report, OPM surveyed federal agencies about their telework policies. The data showed that the total percentages of teleworkers in the federal workforce has doubled to 3.1% since 1998, but it still remains very low. Agency narratives and follow-up discussions reveal that agencies are inconsistent in tracking their teleworkers, especially those who telecommute on a non-scheduled basis or less than 52 days per year. Based on this information, OPM concluded that federal teleworkers are likely undercounted. It's been a challenge for OPM to compile accurate statistics about federal telecommuters because there is no government-wide standard for data collection. 
This is an important concern that I think has to be addressed since the report is intended to provide a baseline from which to assess the progress of federal telework. Today, the subcommittee will ascertain what oversight measures OPM will use to ensure federal agency compliance with Section 359. We'll determine whether OPM provides adequate guidance to assist agencies in determining which positions are eligible for telecommuting. In addition, we'll look forward to hearing about further action OPM will take to clarify the initiative and provide employees with guidance to ensure successful telework experiences. We'll also determine if GSA is using Section 359 as a marketing opportunity to expand its advertising efforts for an increased utilization of the telecenters. Since OPM's interim telecommuting report reveals that there is no official system in place to efficiently and reliably count teleworkers and compile related data, the subcommittee will review the current tracking system and any suggestions for government-wide standardization. The subcommittee will hear testimony from uh, Robert E. Robertson, the Director of the Education Workforce and Income Security Issues, GAO. Teresa Jenkins, the Director of Office of Workforce Relations, OPM. David Bibb, Deputy Associate Administrator of Real Property within the Office of Government-Wide Policy, GSA. Harris Miller, President of the Information Technology Association of America. Mark Stratton, the Vice President of Global Marketing, Siemens Enterprise Networks. And Robert Milkovich, the Managing Director of CAR America. We anticipate having with us today members of the full committee who are not on the subcommittee, as well as members who are not part of the full committee but have a strong interest in this. I ask unanimous consent they be permitted to participate in today's hearing. And with that objection, so ordered. I would now yield to uh, Congressman Turner for any opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I commend you on having this second hearing on this important issue of telecommuting. We all know that the federal government uh, faces a human capital crisis and the federal workforce is indeed aging, and it requires us to be innovative in ways to not only attract and retain federal workers, but to improve uh, worker productivity, uh, morale, and as I said, retention and recruitment. We know that advances in technology in recent years have made telecommuting a far more feasible and attractive choice for employees and employers alike. Today, we're told that about 19 million people telecommute, and the number is increasing rapidly. Despite the fact that telecommuting has been an option for federal employees over the last decade, as we'll hear today from the Office of Personnel Management, only about 45,000 employees, or 2.6 percent of our federal workforce, telecommute once a week, and almost half of those are in one agency. Even though there's been a marked increase in telecommuting, we're still clearly behind the private sector. As some of our witnesses today will testify, the private sector offers valuable insights to us in how to address the barriers faced by organizations attempting to promote telework among their employees. As Chairman mentioned, federal law requires agencies to develop a plan that allows 25 percent of the eligible federal workforce to telecommute as of April 23rd of 2001, and an additional 25 percent must be permitted to telecommute each year over the next three years. Today, we will explore the federal government's progress in developing telework-friendly policies and determine what the Congress and the agencies need to do to make telecommuting a viable option for federal employees. I welcome all of our witnesses today, and again, I thank the Chairman for his continued interest in this important subject. Very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Capitor. Good morning. I'd like to begin by thanking Chairman Davis for inviting me to offer an opening statement this morning. I enjoyed participating in the last hearing on telecommunicating, telecommuting, and I'm happy that you've invited me back. Although I'm not a member of the subcommittee, I greatly appreciate the opportunity to share with you my views on the importance of telecommuting in today's world. As you may know, the district which I represent plays home to the one and only telecenter in the state of West Virginia. The telecenter is located in the town of Ranson in Jefferson County, about an hour outside of Washington, D.C., in an area known as the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia. Over the past several years, there's been a dramatic increase in the population in the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia. In fact, many federal employees are relocating to West Virginia in search of a peaceful, family-friendly environment. In the past, these individuals would face a difficult, congested daily commute through Hagerstown, Maryland on 270 and ultimately on to 495. Today, however, thanks to advanced com computer technology, many of these individuals are capable of telecommuting from workstations 
only miles from their homes in Jefferson County at the Telecenter. Unfortunately, most federal employees in West Virginia can't take advantage of this exciting opportunity. While interest in telecommuting is high among those federal employees, gaining ag agency approval is an arduous, frustrating, and bureaucratic process. Despite the fact that telecommuting and other forms of working at a distance have been thoroughly proven and already commonplace in the private sector, there remain those who are steadfastly opposed to this practice. Why? As the proverb tells us, all things seem difficult before they seem easy. Certain people are just slow to change their way of thinking. In my opinion, it's time for all of us to embrace the practice of telecommuting. Clearly, GSA needs to improve their effort to market the concept of telecommuting to agency management. Emphasis should be placed on the need to comply with the recent changes in the law requiring 25% telecommuting participation among federal employees. Additionally, efforts to streamline the te telecommuting approval process should be promoted. And the length of time from inquiry to implementation of telework should be decreased. Employee interest in telecommuting should be met with enthusiasm, not skepticism. And whenever possible, management should encourage employee participation in telework. It is time to stop resisting the changing structure of our work environment and start using the high-speed computing technology to its fullest potential. On a positive note, since this committee's telecommuting hearing last March, the telecenter in my district has made great progress in promoting and marketing its services to local citizens. Under the capable management of Neil Jagedney, who's in attendance this morning, I'm certain that the Jefferson County Telecenter will continue to make great strides. In fact, Last June, GSA provided $130,000 in additional funding to assist the Jefferson County Telecenter as it moves to become a self-sustaining entity. But funding alone is not enough. We need more federal agencies to actively promote and encourage employee participation in telecommuting programs. The Jefferson County Telecenter can no longer afford to have dozens and dozens, and I think it's almost as many as 70, interested workers stuck in a confusing, lengthy and frustrating application and approval process. Those federal employees who live in the Eastern Panhandle and have a legitimate reason to telecommute should be authorized quickly by their respective employees. Employers, it just makes sense. Almost every name on the waiting list represents a wasted opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, after years of discussion, now it's time for action and I'm hopeful that we can demonstrate leadership necessary to realize the vast potential of telecommuting. And I look forward to listening to the testimony of today's witness. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Ms. Morello. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you uh, for holding this follow-up hearing on uh, teleworking in the federal workplace. With 25 uh, federal agencies located in Montgomery County, Maryland, my district, this issue is of utmost importance to me in my constituents. I also want to thank you for the courtesy of allowing, allowing me as a member of the full government reform and oversight committee, uh, but not of this subcommittee to appear here today because of the interest that I have in this, uh, in this issue. I want to thank you also for your leadership on this issue. And I want to thank someone who's not here today again, that's Mr. Wolf, for all of his efforts to ensure the federal government's support of telework programs and incentives. I look forward to the day that the entire federal workforce will telework to the maximum extent possible. Now, while, there's, while there is no magic bullet that will solve all of our nation's problems, teleworking becomes, becomes pretty close. As has been noted, for every 1% of the Washington metropolitan region workforce that telecommutes, there is a 3% reduction in traffic delays. And during the last hearing, we heard from several federal agencies, including the Office of Personnel Management and General Services Administration. And from the panelists' presentations, a few questions were raised that I hope will be addressed during this hearing. First, how is the government encouraging telework for all qualified federal employees? Second, how are the government agencies addressing obstacles that block teleworking implementation? such as security issues. In addition, what has been done to address these concerns? Finally, what can we do to facilitate a solution for telework programs within the federal government, and more specifically in Montgomery County, Maryland? Today, we are acting as architects of a new mobile work environment. 
and with the cooperation of the Office of Personnel Management and the General Services Administration, the federal government will once again be an example to the states and to the private sector. So again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for the opportunity to attend uh, this uh, hearing this morning. I certainly look forward to hearing from our witnesses. Thank you very much, Mr. Morello. I'm going to now call our panel of witnesses uh, to testify. Robert E. Robertson, the Director of Education, Workforce, and Income Security Issues, GAO. Um, Teresa Jenkins, the Director of Office of Workforce Relations, OPM. Uh, David L. Bibb, the Deputy Associate Administrator of Real Property within the Office of Government-Wide Policy at the GSA. Harris Miller, the President of the Information Technology Association of America. Mark Stratton, the Vice President of Global Marketing for Siemens uh, Enterprise Networks. And uh, Robert Milkovich, the Managing Director of Car America. As you know, it's the policy of this committee that all witnesses be sworn that before they testify. So if you rise with me and raise your right hands. So I swear the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you very much. Um, we've, we've had the testimony ahead of time. Um, to afford sufficient time for witnesses, the, uh, we'd like you to limit your comments to five minutes. There's a light down here in front. When it turns orange, you have one minute left. Uh, when it's red, your five minutes are up and you want to move uh, to summary. Your total written statement uh, is going to be made part of the permanent record. Uh, I'll begin with Mr. Robertson and we'll move right down the line. Thank you. Welcome and thank you for being here. Thank you. Are we on? Thank you for inviting me. You can move it a little closer. Right. There you go. How's this? Better? That's great. Thank you for inviting us to be part of these hearings. Um, good topic, good issues. As you're aware, we work, the work that we'll be discussing today had its origins with a request that we received from Mr. Army last spring. He was essentially interested in identifying potential regulatory tax and liability barriers that concern private sector employers who are considering establishing telecommuting programs. And in July, we briefed Mr. Army and several other congressmen on the results of that work. And what we'll be doing this morning basically is summarizing that work and talking about its application to the public sector. But before I go on to the summer, I'm going to have to admit that I have to use my glasses. Despite having uh, uh, increased the size of the type, I still can't see it. <laughs> it's tough losing your eyesight. In a nutshell, here's our bottom line. Perhaps the biggest challenge to establishing and expanding telecommuting programs in both the public and private sectors involve management's concerns regarding the effect of telecommuting on the operation of their particular organization. These concerns are not necessarily new. They relate to uh, assessing whether an employer has the types of positions and employees that are suitable for telecommuting, protecting proprietary and sensitive data, and establishing cost-effective telecommuting programs. In short, I don't think I can overemphasize uh, the fact that the extent to which telecommuting programs are established or expanded rests in large part on a manager's belief after having looked at all of these concerns that his or her organization's operations are going to fundamentally benefit by establishing a tele telecommuting program. Now, apart from these management concerns, certain federal and state laws and regulations, including those that are governing taxes, workplace safety, workforce record keeping, and liability for home workplace injuries, can also act as potential barriers to telecommuting for both the public and private sectors. Of all the barriers that are related to the laws and regulations, what we'd like to do today is focus your attention on the one that we believe is a key emerging challenge. That involves the applicability of state tax laws to interstate telecommuting arrangements. Here, the basic question for the private sector involves possible increased state tax liabilities for the employer and employee when an employee telecommutes from a state other than the one in which the employer is located. Similarly, from a public sector viewpoint, interstate telecommuting arrangements could open up the possibility of some states double taxing the income of federal telecommuters. Overall, the application of state tax laws to telecommuting arrangements, as well as the application of other laws and regulations that were enacted before our transition to a more technological and information-based economy, is evolving, and the ultimate impact of these laws and regulations remains somewhat unclear at this time. Let me just conclude with some observations on the implications of these barriers for the future of telecommuting. To begin with, we need to acknowledge that telecommuting offers a new set of opportunities that could benefit employers, employees, and society as a whole. These have been mentioned earlier in the hearings. 
However, whether these opportunities are realized will depend on resolving fundamental questions about how telecommuting affects an employer's ability to manage employees and other resources. As we noted earlier, some of those questions deal with the suitability of telecommuting as a work arrangement, as well as questions about data security and overall costs. Knowing the extent to which these questions apply to federal agencies would provide important information for making decisions about telecommuting by federal workers. These were, this was referred to earlier by Representative Morella, trying to get a handle on just what, how extensively these obstacles apply to the federal agencies. Realizing the full potential of telecommuting can also, also requires that we look beyond internal management questions and concerns to the laws that govern, or, govern our, an organization's operating environment. Some of these laws were put in place before we could imagine a world in which employees lived in one state, but through technology, worked in another distant state. As a result, these laws may unintentionally discourage telecommuting. Further examining how current laws and regulations could potentially impact telecommuters and their employers would provide the opportunity to mitigate their possible effects. In conclusion, pursuing the question of how to promote telecommuting is really a question of how to adapt current management practices as well as laws and regulations to changing work arrangements that are and will be part of the information age in which we now live. Mr. Chairman, that concludes my station, statement and I'll be happy to answer questions at okay. a later time. Thank you very much, Ms. Jenkins. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, I appreciate your invitation to come here today to discuss the progress OPM has made since March in promoting telework within the federal government. We take our role very seriously and are intensely focused on fulfilling our responsibilities under Public Law 106-346. On March 22nd, then Acting OPM Director Steve Cohen discussed plans for assessing the status of telework in the federal government and the barriers agencies confront as they move to increase telework participation. Today, I will describe our activities since the March hearing as well as upcoming initiatives. Agencies were surveyed in April, and the results were included in the interim report on the status of telework in the federal government. The survey identified 76 agencies that have telework policies covering the majority of their employees. Only 18 agencies reported having no telework policies. The April survey indicates that the percentage of federal employees who telecommute at least one day per week has nearly doubled since 1998 but the percentage is still small, 2.6% today, today compared to 1.4% in 1998. The data reported in April reflect an undercount of actual telecommuting <coughs> practices within agencies. Some agencies were not yet tracking regularly scheduled or ad hoc teleworkers. Other agencies had no formal telework policies in place at the time of our survey. Still others had only draft policies or were modifying existing policies to comply with the public law. We have contacted agencies that reported having no or only draft policies in place in April, and considerable progress is being made toward formalizing and fully implementing telework policies. In addition, since April, OPM has gauge, engaged in a number of activities to assist agencies in increasing their telework participation. We shared best practices and aggressively marketed telework. We provided agencies with our study, a compendium of successful telework stories that illustrate how federal agencies have overcome common telework barriers. In late June, OPM and GSA launched a joint website to make it simple for agencies to acquire all the information they need about teleworking in the federal government. We advised agencies to consider all positions as appropriate for telework. This positive analytical approach focuses managers' attention on job characteristics for determining whether a position is suitable for telework. When the agencies report to us later this year, we will have more reliable data to help refine calculations of actual telework utilization. And although federal agency progress has been significant, much work remains to be done. Management reluctance, employee fears are two major barriers to telework implementation. Our next steps include a telework leadership seminar for top-level agency officials in October 
an internet-based training module by November to break down major telework barriers, a satellite educational broadcast to federal facilities in November, a conference in January aimed at agency supervisors and managers, and a telework guide for managers and supervisors to be published in the fall. Also in the fall, the Interagency Telework Issues Group, which was formed in September 2000, will provide OPM and GSA with their recommendations in the areas of data security, computer equipment, legal and procurement issues, human resource management issues, health and safety, training and taxes. We are also assisting agencies with assessing the impact of telework on productivity, recruitment, workforce stability, and these demonstrated benefits should help to change the perspectives of managers unconvinced that telework can assist them with their human capital challenges. Mr. Chairman, I believe that telework is good for business, for employees, and the environment. And thank you again for inviting me, Mr. Chairman. I will be happy to respond to any questions. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Mr. Bibb, thanks for being with us. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee and subcommittee. I'm David Bibb from the General Services Administration, and today I will discuss GSA's telework efforts within our own agency and our support of telework government-wide. Telework, sometimes referred to as telecommuting, can be defined as performing agency work outside of the primary office facility. This includes working at home, in a telecenter, or in the field directly supporting customer agencies. Public Law 106-346, which we've heard about this morning, was enacted last fall. It requires each federal agency to establish a policy under which eligible employees of the agency may participate in telework to the maximum extent possible without diminished employee performance. GSA has established that required policy. Our agency has a little over 14,300 associates in our workforce. Approximately 12,000 of our associates are eligible to telework based on the broadest interpretation of eligibility. Under GSA's policy, 100% of these 12,000 eligible persons may participate in telework, subject only to concurrence by their supervisors that this won't diminish their performance. Approximately 2,500, or 21%, of GSA's eligible associates telework on a regular or ad hoc basis. Approximately 800 telework on a regularly scheduled basis one day per week, an additional 200 telework on a regularly scheduled basis one day per pay period, and we estimate another 1,500 telework on an ad hoc basis. We are finalizing an electronic questionnaire to solicit additional feedback from GSA associates about teleworking, including more information about potential barriers to increasing the telework participation level beyond the 21% that we now have, such as agency culture and manager's apprehension. In addition to telework, GSA also supports other programs that help to reduce transportation, congestion, energy consumption, and associated vehicle emissions. Approximately 59% of all GSA associates participate in the alternative work schedule program. This gets those employees off the highways one or two days per two-week pay period. Also, 29% of our GSA associates participate in the transit subsidy program. In addition to efforts within the agency, GSA supports Public Law 106-346 on a government-wide basis by its public building service operation of telecenters and by its Office of Government-Wide Policy support of OPM's promotion of telework government-wide. GSA's public building service has provided 15 telecenters in the metro Washington area that offer a combined total of 326 fully equipped workstations. The telecenters, and at this point, Mr. Chairman, I'd like some of the numbers I will give you are slightly different from my printed testimony because we were working with the center directors able to up, complete updating them uh, last night. The telecenters currently serve 462 federal teleworkers representing 19 executive branch agencies. And although utilization over the years has followed a slightly downward trend, center directors are now reporting a positive uptick in usage. The current overall utiliz utilization rate is 55 percent. Forty-five percent of those are federal workers. The other 10 percent uh, are private sector uh, employees. The centers as a group do lose money and are currently being subsidized by GSA's Public Building Service Federal Buildings Fund. However, it is possible, as OPM works to carry out the telework provisions of Public Law 106-346, that overall, overall increasing numbers of teleworkers in the federal government will result in greater utilization of the telecenters. 
In fact, our updated figures show that the number of federal telecenter users is up 11 percent since the law passed last fall. Center directors also report an upsurge in inquiries by federal employees about uh, potentially working in the centers. Since the March 2001 telework hearing, our marketing efforts of the telecenters have concentrated on improved signage, open houses, telework training seminars, brochures, and local newspaper ads. Another role for GSA is in the policy arena. For example, GSA's Office of Government-Wide Policy worked with OPM Associates to develop the one-stop federal telework website that's already been mentioned today. In response also to a request from Congress, we recently awarded a contract to identify technology barriers and solutions for federal home-based telework. The study, we hope, will be done um, in early 2002. Again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate having the opportunity to appear here today, and I'm prepared to answer any questions uh, the members may have. Thank you very much. Mr. Miller, thanks for being here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Harris Miller, President of the Information Technology Association of America, representing 500 of the largest IT companies across the United States. And I'm very pleased to let you know, Mr. Chairman, that my son Derek, who attended high school with your son, helped to draft this testimony. <laughs> the simple message I have if for you. If this is anything like his graduation speech, it's going to be spectacular. Thank you very much. Very, very kind of you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, the simple message is in the 21st century, work is no longer a place. And those managers and those organizations who continue to think that work means you have to be in a certain place at a certain time simply do not understand the realities of the 21st century. Congressman Turner mentioned the figure of 2.6 percent of federal employees are telecommuting as opposed to about 10 percent in the private sector, but I would contend it even understates how fast the private sector is moving, because if you eliminate from the private sector jobs which cannot be telecommuting, such as manufacturing and certain retail jobs, in fact, it's much higher in the private sector. It's probably close to 20 percent now. So the federal government seems to be falling even farther behind. So my message to the federal managers is not to blaspheme, let thy employees go. To me, the issue really is, to a large extent, attitude. There are certain legal and regulatory administrative barriers which have already been mentioned, but basically it's psychological. One has to understand that workers can be, and in fact are frequently, more effective and more productive. For example, AT&T teleworkers work five more hours per week at home than AT&T office workers. J.D. Edwards, one of the largest global software companies, teleworkers, are 20 to 25 percent more productive than their office counterparts. AT&T estimates it saves over $3,000 annually per teleworker. Telework can cut corporate real estate costs by 25 percent or more. And of course, teleworkers save substantial time by not being engaged in the commute. Also, an interesting data point from AT&T survey, 77 percent of employees working from home from AT&T reported much greater satisfaction with their current career responsibilities than before teleworking. So we see the benefits are clear. More hours, more productivity, cutting costs, saving time, and psychologically, for the employees, frequently much higher satisfaction, much happier, much more product productive. There's, of course, also the challenge for the managers. And I admit myself to be a bit of a late convert. I'm one of those people who also believe that you need to manage people, you need to see them. But I've come around and realized now that many of my employees do now telework. They are very productive. They're very much engaged. And I suggest that federal managers need to open their ears and eyes and minds to this opportunity. Let me talk about some of the other benefits that haven't been discussed here very extensively. One of the big issues that this Congress and our nation is wrestling with is getting more broadband into the homes. In fact, Congress has a big debate potentially coming up here about that issue in the very near future. Well, one, people, one factor people have not focused enough on is the relationship between telecommuting and broadband. In fact, as it turns out, if you look at people who have broadband into the homes, and it's now only about 7 or 8 percent, which is pretty disappointing considering what we expected in 1996 when we passed the Telecommunications Reform Act. But it's interesting that about 80 percent of those people are telecommuters. What that tells me is that if people have a real reason to have broadband, they'll get it because it affects their work. Imagine a, a part of Northern Virginia in Congressman Davis's district or Congresswoman Morella's district or 
Congresswoman Capita's district, were in a neighborhood with a lot of federal employees who got together and negotiated broadband into their neighborhood and reduced rates because they could be more effective telecommuters. Set up kind of a buying co-op that would convince the cable company or the satellite company or the telephone companies, the competitive local exchange carriers, to offer broadband because they knew they had a built-in customer base because there are so many federal employees concentrated in Virginia, Maryland, and West Virginia and other places around Washington, D.C. So some great opportunities to drive more broadband. Let me talk about a couple of other challenges, though. One, Congresswoman Morella mentioned, the information security challenge. This is not just a challenge for the federal government, it's a challenge for the private sector. We need to make sure that if people are working at home, they have information security. But another challenge is to make sure the technology is current. You can't have one version of software in the office and another version on the home computer. So the challenge is to make sure that all the technology is kept current, and that's something people are learning to live with. The regulatory barriers were already mentioned by the witness from GAO, so I won't go through them in great detail, but certainly we share his concern about the taxation issue, home deductions, and we certainly hope that we won't have a repeat of that effort by OSHA a couple years ago to think about trying to regulate teleworking. I think everyone realized that was a very silly idea and hope it's gone away. One last issue I'd like to mention, Mr. Chairman, is contractors. We're talking today primarily about federal employees, but keep in mind a huge percentage of the IT work is done by the federal government by IT contractors. And yet contracting officers almost never allow the contractors to allow their workers to telecommute because there is no specific leadership from the Congress or from above. And that could also provide the same kind of benefits we've been discussing. If an IT worker is working for one of the major companies in the Washington area or, or anywhere around the country that provides services to the government, if they are encouraged to telework, that provides the same benefits, cutting down on commuting time, cutting down on pollution, increased productivity. But if the contract officers have the mindset that the person who is the contractor has to be sitting in a particular office at a particular time from 8 to, to 6 every day, then you're not going to get over this barrier. So again, I believe it's psychological. It may require legislation for Congress to direct the agencies to do this, but right now I don't see any regulatory barriers. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me just add, we are putting that in our bill, uh, with working with your groups and stuff like that that we'll be introducing uh, a little later this session. Ms. Tratton, before I get to you, Mrs. Norton may have to go off to another hearing. I want to allow her to make a few comments. She's uh, trying to take a leadership role in this area as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, uh, and I thank you for inviting me to this subcommittee hearing. I'm a member of the full committee, but not of this important subcommittee. I am a member of the Transportation Committee, uh, and I regard this as a transportation issue and a major transportation issue. I very much uh, thank Chairman Davis, with whom I work so closely on regional and District of Columbia issues, for focusing, as he is, on telecommuting. Um, I'm very concerned at what I can only call negligible pro uh, progress in the federal sector here. I was very glad to hear about what GSA is doing. It, clearly, we have a huge amount of unevenness here. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I do have a uh, suggestion uh, as to what we might do uh, to clear up a lot of our transportation problems on which you and I work so closely. Uh, j just, just have uh, uh, more uh, of the residents of uh, the region understand that the way, the way to con the way to to um, counterman this transportation problem is to do what so many of you are already understanding you must do, and that is move to the District of Columbia. <laughs> <laughs> you will not ha you will not need telecommuting. You will not need transportation. You will live in one of the uh, variety of beautiful neighborhoods in our town, and this problem will go away. Now, inevitably, some of you will have to go to Fairfax. Others of you will make your way to Montgomery. The only reason they are there in the first place. When I was here, when I was growing Ms. up... Ms. Norton, let me just join you in that. I particularly would give that to my Democrats. Or welcome <laughs> to move <Michigan. laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take that, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> I, I do want you, to, you and, and my good friend Connie Morella, who chairs uh, the district committee, to know when I was a child growing up in the District of Columbia, uh, uh, Fairfax and Montgomery were cow country, and as far as those of us who live in the District of Columbia are concerned, they still are. <laughs> uh, you, uh, Montgomery and Fairfax is there only because there was not a, enough room in the District of Columbia for the entire federal presence. The reason that Montgomery and Fairfax have become so prosperous is because 
first of the federal pre presence, which then spawned everything else, including the whole, uh, whole IT um, sector. Seriously, though, we have uh, a terrible national crisis. I only hope some parts of the United States have, have done better than we have in this region, because we are the poster child for a transportation uh, crisis. And uh, we are sitting on our thumbs and doing uh, nothing about it. You would think, given uh, the fact that this part of the country is way ahead of other parts, uh, in IT that telecommuting would be far advanced here. And in fact, the opposite is the case. Traffic problems are sapping the energy and the money out of this region. If, in fact, somebody is looking where to locate, whereas normally locating near the nation's capital or locating particularly in Montgomery or Fairfax would have been prime places given the workforce, uh, and given the other advantages, these parts, this, this part of the country is becoming just the opposite, place not to come. Uh, and I think places in the far west where there are equally good workforces, where they have telecommuting further advanced, and where traffic is not the problem it has become here, are likely to uh, overtake us in, in, in competition. Uh, if I may say so, Mr. Chairman, uh, as um, a person who chaired a federal agency, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, uh, I believe that a, and, and concentrated on management and on reform of the agency uh, when I was there under President Carter, I believe that the problem, the challenge really lies for management. Uh, until management understands how to supervise uh, and hold employees accountable who indeed are engaged in telecommuting, I don't think that, that there is a great incentive for them to change the culture that, that in fact has been a part of the culture of our country and of the federal government forever. And I don't think that they will know how to do it on their own. Uh, I was pleased to hear the OPM testimony because I believe you've got to begin at the top on this one. You've got to make managers understand how to do it. We're not born into this world knowing how to supervise people who work from home. We know how to hold you accountable if you are sitting right under our nose. This, this, this really envisions an entirely different way to manage employees, and the federal government is way behind on understanding that because we have not given our own managers, who are very good at managing, uh, the tools to cross over from the old industrial uh, society management to the new management that a technological society demands. And that is why I think the chairman's leadership here in focusing us so that we come up with true remedies. And I want to say to you, Mr. Chairman, if it takes legislation, fine. I, I do believe the federal government is quite capable of doing it uh, with hearings like yours that involve the kind of oversight to give the government the incentive to move far more rapidly on telecommuting. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Norton. Mr. Stratton, thank you. Uh, if, I'd like to ask you uh, for Chairman, maybe another I, six. Mr. Chairman, I will, I will be back. I'm going to another hearing okay. that I will be back. Thank, thank, thanks. With your uh, permission, Mr. Chairman, after I read my statement, I'd like to take about an additional 60 seconds and just show you some uh, be examples of what we're doing. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, and other members of the subcommittee, thank you for providing Siemens the opportunity to discuss its experience as a pioneer and leader in teleworking. Siemens is one of the oldest and largest electronic companies in the world, operating in 192 countries. In the United States, we employ over 85,000 people in 700 locations with a presence in each of the 50 states. At Siemens, we both use and sell teleworking technologies. Siemens views teleworking simply as a means to allow for geographic dispersion of the workforce using electronically supported communications and collaborations. Siemens initially deployed teleworking because of significant cost savings opportunities, but other benefits have accrued over the years. As a result, Teleworking became a mainstream part of our business model in 1996. Today, 20% of our employees are full-time teleworkers, and roughly 40% are what we would call mobile workers. Teleworking has enabled us to decrease our office space by 35% nationwide, resulting in annual cost savings of over $3 million in the 3,000-person Enterprise Networks Division alone. Productivity increases of over 20% are typical, with no decline in customer satisfaction. In addition, we have grown to appreciate the benefits to our employees' families and ultimately our communities. 
Business benefits are measurable and recurring from entire departments to individual employees. Teleworking allows us to retain high-performing employees who contribute beyond their peers and enables us to help dual-income families. It also allows us to recruit part-time workers with great talents who previously had been unavailable to us, stay-at-home parents who want to work while the kids are at school, or retirees who want continued income and intellectual challenge. For example, through teleworking, Siemens retained a high-performing Virginia-based contracts administrator whose husband was transferred to Texas. Instead of going through the exhaustive and costly process of rehiring, retraining, and agonizing over whether the new hire could match an employee's standards, Siemens placed her in the teleworking program. While the Siemens business units continue to thrive with such solutions, our employees also reap significant quality of life benefits. We all are aware of the cost of living and the choices families must make, PTA meeting or late night project, coaching little league or overcoming deadlines. Successful businesses realize that these concerns impact employees' quality of work, tenure, loyalty, and motivation. Teleworking solutions can mitigate seemingly difficult choices because geography and time zones become transparent. Businesses with telework programs can attract and retain the best in a highly competitive environment. Society also benefits from teleworking. The actions taken by hundreds of teleworkers can reduce traffic congestion, energy consumption, and pollution, a practical, not wacko, environmentalism. Teleworking can present opportunities to improve the quality of life for many Americans. For example, a key individual in Siemens became ill with multiple sclerosis that forced him to reconsider full-time employment. Teleworking came to the rescue. He continued to share his intellectual capital with his coworkers, impacting our business as if he were at his desk five days a week. Our teleworking success did not occur overnight. We had to decide to adopt teleworking as a business practice using technology to facilitate and management to enable. Siemens faced some of the concerns identified in the recent GAO report for the Honorable Dick Army. The report cited management concerns in key areas. The identification of employees and positions suitable for teleworking. The security of sensitive data and the ability to remotely monitor teleworkers. The impact of teleworking on a business's profitability. All are valid concerns and coupled with liability and privacy issues, they are at first glance significant hurdles to implementing teleworking. But imagine, if you will, a three-story building in an office complex ensnarled in nonstop traffic with over 25,000 square feet for 60 employees sitting at their desks in a high rent area. Day by day, in sweltering summer heat or snowy winter days, the workers commute in to receive calls from clients seeking technical assistance. Now envision the same group of workers dispersed in over 23 states, not worrying about the road conditions or the issue of latchkey, latchkey children. They continue to perform their jobs, in fact, are more likely to process more calls, stay with Siemens, and maintain high customer satisfaction. This is the new Siemens Customer Technical Support Center, completely operated by teleworking agents. We now manage our teleworkers in a variety of methods, including by objective, by measurable and real-time data, and by the traditional performance measurements. The teleworking requires that managers be very clear in job responsibilities and objectives, and quick and forthright in performance communications. Our technology allows us to interact with our teleworkers by ensuring their business numbers ring them at home, on their cell phone, or in a hotel environment. This flexibility allows our managers the opportunity to maximize inner working with their teleworkers and maximize the employees' opportunities to succeed. With, as with any business practice, teleworking must be evaluated through an ongoing dialogue between management and employee to ensure common business goals are achieved. In sum, once acclimated, both management and employees simply view teleworking as a way of doing business at Siemens and not an individual pr privilege. Mr. Chairman, we applaud your leadership in focusing congressional attention on teleworking and its potential benefits to government. We believe te teleworking can help incentivize federal workers to stay in government and can be used as a recruiting tool. In addition, as Siemens has demonstrated, teleworking programs can also reduce costs and improve productivity. We owe a debt of gratitude to Congressman Wolf for his determined efforts to expand teleworking opportunities for both public and private sector employees. We believe the Telework Tax Incentive Act introduced by Congressman Wolf is also a model to incentivize private sector organizations to implement teleworking programs. 
Siemens also recommends that the federal government look at ways to partner with the private sector and consider pilot programs that capitalize on the expertise and lessons of private sector programs. After all, for most of human history, people worked out of their homes. It is only recently, with the ri rise of industrial and information revolutions, that large centralized office complex have become commonplace, and commonplace only because communication and information were bound to a single location. Now today, communication and information are not limited to single locations because new technologies have enabled a mobile and distributed workforce. For example, by 2002, there will be more mobile phones in the world than wired phones. And by 2006, the internet will be accessed more by mobile devices than wired devices. Recently, there was a lot of publicity and consternation in the press regarding the president's month-long vacation. However, after having watched the coverage of this and many presidential vacations, I could not help but think to myself that presidents often telework. And being a marketing guy, I couldn't also help but think what a PR opportunity it could have been. If presidents can telework with the most important job in the world, why can't the average worker do it with maybe just a little bit less responsibility? Mr. Chairman, Siemens appreciates this opportunity to discuss the issues confronting implementation of a teleworking program. We are proud of the success of our program and feel strongly that the teleworking business model can be transferred to the public sector. We fully support your efforts to expand teleworking opportunities. Uh, with that, let me just uh, very quickly show you a couple pictures. Uh, this is just an example of a teleworker coming into our Reston office, and you go into a computer and you, d you assign into a cube. And uh, Tim, if you could show the next slide. And what the teleworker see sees is they see a schematic of the teleworking area, and they click on the cube that they would like to have for the day, and then their phone number and their PC all go there. Now, I think this is one of the uh, most interesting uh, pictures. Uh, rather than having uh, filing cabinets, et cetera, et cetera, the teleworkers have uh, uh, cabinets, much like you would have in a high school. And they go to the cabinets, and they have some shelves there. You'll often see pictures of their families, uh, open cans of Coke. And you can see that they have a cart. When I have an example of it uh, right here. Let me just I'll walk around you for a second. And they put their PC on the cart, and you roll the cart over the cube. As you can see, this is a live car. It's very hard to get here. Very much Tim. Um, you'll, you'll see things, like I said, like pictures, personalization, uh, just like people uh, would do uh, in an office. Thank you, and then the next picture is just, uh, it looks like a regular office cube, because it is. The only difference is that the, uh, the telecommuter's phone automatically rings, just like it was their office all the time. And when they leave the office, their cell phone automatically rings if they would like it to, uh, just like if you called their office number. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, thank you very much. That was, that was good spin on the president's vacation, te telecommute, the president's telecommuting initiative. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to let Ari Fleischer know about that. Mr. Milkovich, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the Subcommittee on Technology and Procurement Policy, I thank you for your invitation to speak here today on issues relating to commercial real estate solutions for the private sector, specifically as it relates to teleworking. Uh, I'm going to work between two uh, sets of paper here. One is my written testimony, and then the other is to address some of the questions that uh, were submitted to me in the invitation letter uh, dated August 27th of 2001 uh, from the chairman. Uh, I would like to uh, say thank you to Mark. Having been on a plane quite a bit lately, I thought this was a self-administered beverage cart. <laughs> so I'm, I'm glad to know. I have seen these, though, with, uh, with the work in the... Some days it is. ...in the private sector. <laughs> uh, again, uh, I'm Robert Milkovich, Managing Director for Car America, and I'd like to give a, a, just a quick uh, history on Car America Realty Corporation. We're a publicly traded real estate investment trust, commonly known as a REIT. Uh, we were born out of the Oliver Carr Company uh, in 1993. Many of you in the NCR region know the Oliver Carr Company, which, which has operated here for over 40 years. Uh, currently, we're in 12 markets across the country. We have 287 buildings that total well over 20 million square feet of commercial office space. Um, I bring this to your attention because in 1997, we saw quite a movement for the alternative workplace solution in the private sector. With that, our research uh, and data that we collected, we invested in HQ Global Workplaces, essentially an executive suites operator. Uh, concurrent to that, we 
piloted a target program called Now Space in Atlanta, Georgia. And that essentially was turnkey office space, which included the furnitures, fixtures, and equipment that people could come in and what we would determine is plug and play. You could essentially contract for the space on a Friday and be up and running on a Monday. Uh, this program was successful enough that we also deployed those efforts into the Dallas market as well. Uh, we find that the drivers behind this were the need for speed, growth, flexibility, and low capital expenditure to entry. It also helped in employee recruitment and retention to highlight a few items. I offer this uh, as, a, as a background insofar as our company is concerned because we see and track the movement in the private sector. Another case study that I'd like to utilize is what we refer to as the Schwab Hotel experience. In an effort to meet the demands of a longstanding customer, we built, operated an office hoteling facility for Charles Schwab in Walnut Creek, California. This facility was, to meet, was open to meet the needs of the employee base at Schwab that lives north and northeast of San Francisco and battles traffic congestion into the city. The space is equipped with FF&E and a sophisticated reservation software system to allow employees to schedule and manage their time more efficiently. The reservation system has the ability to track and report on space utilization. This attribute is paramount to management for controlling costs and monitoring the workforce. Now the employee-manager relationship can be tracked electronically and communication can be made simple. Another powerful attribute of this facility is the capability for employee recruitment and retention. Equally important, this modern technology promotes a seamless integration of the employee's workspace at a variety of places. The experience enables employees to work from multitude location of locations, thus spending less time commuting and more time productivity, more time productively at work. The benefits are endless, supporting the Clean Air Act and other responsibilities that corporations must meet in today's competitive world. The economic benefits are substantial. Most telework and hoteling programs strive to capture a minimum ratio of one workspace per two employees. This, in simple math, can result in a cost saving in annualized rent of as much as 25 percent. In fact, most of the insurance companies that we have interviewed target 33 percent as a goal. For large private sector space users, this can be and have a substantial impact to the bottom line. Uh, let me address uh, a couple of the items that were in the invitation letter. One was managerial uh, barriers that we've encountered in the private sector that we've identified. Uh, one is managing from a distance for employers. That's obviously a big cultural issue. And we also see it from the employee's standpoint, employees' concern about career path and being connected to the organization. Uh, certainly technology can help to bridge this gap but there is that old style of management that still believes in out of sight is out of mind. This also calls to question, should people work from home or a third place such as a telework center? Uh, another issue that, we, uh, that I address in your letter is the private sector implementation. Uh, two other cases that I'll bring to bear here. One is Aetna. As an example, they've instituted a program whereby claims processors can work from home Managers can easily monitor the number of claims processed and the benefit to the company is less office space. I think this is a particular situation that addresses how private sectors can monitor the workload. You also have the most successful model that's been out there in the private sector and that's large accounting firms that have been practicing and perfecting this type of business model for years. The genesis of this success is due to the nature of the work. To be profitable, they must have employees in the client's offices requiring less office space for themselves. Telecommunicating, telecommuting offers significant benefits to the private sector, and those are obvious in space reduction, flexibility, employee recruitment, and reduction. Uh, concurrently, or in conclusion, I should say, I'm looking at the clock now, my apologies. In conclusion, teleworking in the private sector is an effective tool in use by many companies for employee recruitment and retention and offers an economic benefit. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're going to start with questions. I'll start uh, with Ms. Capito. I believe, Mr. Robertson, you may be able to answer this question. In thinking of the tele, uh, telecenter in Jefferson County, where I mentioned there were seven folks who have been on the waiting list for, for quite a while to try to uh, 
telecommute at least one day a week from a variety of different agencies. Now, when you look at a private company, uh, lots of times they'll have a, you know, a, a structure where there's a personnel office that's you know, handling all of those kinds of concerns. Do you see that one of the problems is the variety and the vast uh, differences between the different agencies in the federal government, that that's one of the stumbling blocks, or, um, is, it, uh, or is it something else? Well, we didn't specifically look at uh, telecommuting centers, uh, but I imagine that, that um, when you have several different federal agencies working out of the same uh, center with several different sets of rules and regulations, you know, there can be, uh, uh, they can act as obstacles to mo making the most efficient use of that telecenter. Well, may I ask then, Mr. Stratton from Siemens, in, in your telecommuting uh, experience, are all the rules and regulations um, centered in one personnel office, or is it done through the different departments? Yeah, we, we've done, uh, we've, we've learned a lot about how to do it, and there's actually in the handouts that we have a, a good overview of some of the policies. So we have, we have pretty explicit agreements with each teleworker. Uh, now, one of the things that we do differently and is a problem that we encountered is teleworking, the employees love it, so they're like, okay, I want to telework two days a week. But what they want to have is they want to have an office fully functioning, and then they want you to have a, you know, a fully staffed office at their home. So one of the things that we had to do is you, we, you, you can't be both. You make a choice. It's either an office, an office worker, or a teleworker. And that doesn't mean you wouldn't allow somebody to telework a day a week or something like that. Uh, but you're not going to pay for both as a company because the driver for the company is productivity and cost savings. And I think those are the right drivers for uh, the government as well. So I would say that, that um, we have, yes, we have common practices. We differentiate between teleworkers and office workers. And the other thing is, is that uh, teleworkers, they still need that community. And so that's why I think the hoteling concept that I showed you is specific to, in this particular case, a sales and engineering function so that when they do come in, they do get together. Mm -hmm. So I think, I think that is something you have to think through because the communications when you're dispersed uh, becomes key. Oh. I, that's the end of my questions. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Morella? You know, it, it comes down to uh, leadership, uh, a belief, a commitment to doing what's right, trust. This reminds me of our, our Y2K, Mr. Miller, the coal concept of the need to trust, and then it comes down to security also. And I, I just wondered if um, maybe I'll start off with uh, Mr. Roberts and if you would indicate what you have seen with regard to the security issue. Well, it's, we've talked about it already this morning. I think the point has been made that, uh, that uh, the security issues uh, are big in the public and private sector even before you throw in telecommuting to the mm -hmm. mix. And when you throw in telecommuting and you're talking about accessing an organization's, possibly an organization's central database, then, you know, you raise a level of concern. And there's people here that can talk more about how to build firewalls and so on and so forth. But it's an issue. It's an issue in both the public and private sector. I'm not sure, uh, you know, what the, what the solution is, or if there's an easy solution beyond uh, using the technology as best as possible to, to uh, secure that data. But there could be simple ways of addressing some of the security concerns too, just through, and, and this is, this is very, very non-technical, but basically having in the federal government, for example, making sure that all workers were aware of how to handle sensitive data uh, and making sure that all uh, federal workers who are telecommuting in particular uh, understood uh, what to do and, and, and how to handle this type of data. And it may, it may uh, in some cases, uh, require that there be some limits on the use of certain types of sensitive data by, by uh, federal telecommuters. You, you know, one thing I, I noted in listening to the wonderful testimony that each and every one of you presented, I don't think there's any um, partnerships going on or any sharing of best techniques or standards or practices with the public sector and the private sector. I mean, we hear from um, ITAA and uh, from Siemens uh, uh, and Car America about how teleworking is succeeding. It seems to me there should be more of a sharing 
Um, would any of you like to comment on whether there are any attempts to do that and whether or not you think this is a, um, a stellar idea that we should develop further? Right, Mr. Bibb. I would just say from the standpoint of GSA, yeah, it's, it's a great idea and, and we are trying our best to do that. We're uh, prime members of the International Telework Association and Council, which is a, which is a joint partnership of private sector firms and the federal government. Uh, in fact, we're trying to do that in, a, in many of the arenas where we operate. And our website, which we've talked about, the joint OPM GSA website, does contain best practices, success stories, and that sort of thing. So, yes, it makes all the sense in the world. You're absolutely right to learn from the private sector firms, and we think vice versa in some cases. And you may want to have an exchange of people, too. I mean, they may not go visit and see what it's, how it's working. Uh, uh, do you want to comment on that, Mr. Miller? Yeah, I would agree from the private know. sector standpoint. I'm, I was very interested to hear about uh, Ms. Jenkins' comment about the telework leadership seminar. If there's some role for the private sector to play in that in terms of giving some examples, uh, companies like Siemens could testify about their success, if that's helpful to give real-world examples. Let me go back to your first question, uh, Congressman Morell, about the security. I think that's an excuse, not a reason for telecommuting. Uh, I certainly agree with what Mr. Robertson said. There, there are myriad challenges. But as we know from where the government itself already is, when they're not telecommuting, they're pretty far behind in information security. The recent GAO report on Department of Commerce just being one very glaring example of how the government is behind. There's no intrinsic reason, though, the telecommuters, whether they're telecommuting from a telecenter uh, that uh, Congressman Capito talked about or telecommuting from their home, that they cannot be properly outfitted with the technology and the people and the processes to secure information. Obviously, there's some types of jobs that are so sensitive that you'd never want to have anybody outside the building. But for the, most of the government workforce we're talking about, I don't see any obstacles whatsoever that can't be overcome fairly straightforwardly. Mm -hmm. Can be overcome. Did you want to comment on that, Ms. Jenkins? Yes, please. Um, as far as partnering with the private sector, we've done um, a lot of work with AT&T since their testimony here in March. Um, they participated with us uh, in a strategic planning session, uh, acting as our advisors and consultants on how we can um, help the agencies uh, comply with the public law. And we are continuing to partner with them. We've learned a great deal from AT&T. Uh, they have helped us to expand our thinking uh, about how we can uh, in increase the number of teleworkers. They've talked to us about training efforts that they found to be appropriate, and we have adopted many of their philosophies. And as far as our upcoming leadership conference, we do plan to uh, extend an invitation okay. to both Siemens and AT&T. We think that it's important for agency leaders to hear firsthand about how telework can actually work and help them with their human capital issues. And on the issue of security, we have uh, a number of things that we've been doing at, at OPM. We have uh, had uh, many conversations with the Federal CIO Council, particularly the um, Security Committee, and how we can perhaps establish some government-wide um, guidance for agencies to use. Uh, we encourage agencies to include the security officials on their planning team when they're establishing telework policies. We also encourage managers uh, to precede a telework arrangement by addressing security issues with their employees and ensuring that they have uh, up-to-date virus uh, protection and proper firewall software on their computers. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I thank you, and I know my time has elapsed, but I just want you to thank Mr. Bibb about the fact that you have 100 percent participation in Frederick, Maryland. Are there particular factors there that you don't find in Montgomery County, Maryland, that where we could... Uh, establish such a record? Well, as you know, we're going to be taking a look uh, at the feasibility of a couple of centers in Montgomery County, Maryland. I don't have answers to that, but that will certainly be some of the items we're looking at as to whether we can make a go of it. Uh, we'll be uh, responding to the report language in the House Appropriation right. Bill and uh, giving you a full report on how those compare. Yes. Splendid. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Let me just note that uh, our colleague, Mr. Moran, has just joined us, uh, another strong champion of uh, telecommuting here in the, in the Washington suburbs. Um, Jim, you want to make any statement at this point? Uh, it's, uh, it's not necessary. I'm sure that uh, anything uh, profound and constructive has already been said that could be said from the dais. So I've, yeah, I think I got most of that in my opening statement. Yeah. <laughs> I trust you did. Uh, and certainly Mr. Turner had a statement. I'm sure that covered it as well. 
Well, we we finished the panel, uh, and I'm, I'm, let me ask a few questions as we uh, go through now of the panel. First of all, a great testimony. Um, let me uh, start. We've heard a lot about the need for incentives to promote telework. As you know, Mr. Wolf has introduced the Telework Tax in <coughs> Initiative Act. In Virginia, Governor Gilmore introduced the Telework Virginia, a public-private matching program to provide uh, financial incentives to Virginia businesses to start or expand existing telework programs. Can any of you think of any incentives that could encourage the federal agencies and employees to embrace uh, telecommuting more uh, fully? And let me just say that we are working on our SARA bill uh, coming out of this committee that will, uh, I think, enhance federal contractors, uh, Mr. Miller, with what you suggested, uh, allowing them to use more telecommuting in what they are doing. A lot of this is managerial. The managers are just not comfortable. It's just they're in the old paradigm. But seeing uh, what AT&T testified last time, what uh, the Siemens and, and Carr have done, uh, I think shows us that the private sector has, has found this to be uh, just excellent for recruiting and retention. Uh, Mrs. Norton mentioned the, the traffic uh, situations. It's got a lot of good elements if we can learn to utilize it uh, correctly. But are there more incentives that we can give you uh, in the, at the uh, federal level to make it uh, more palatable and so we can move this faster? And we've, we've used the stick. I mean, I think Mr. Wolf's legislation was kind of the stick. We give you deadlines and that kind of stuff. Yeah, uh, Harris. And then more. Uh, I'm sorry, in the private sector, frequently the incentives are strictly financial. You simply say to a manager, here's a way to save money. Uh, it was covered in the testimony from uh, my colleague on the left about Siemens, it's the savings in real estate, uh, the more productivity out of the workers. And obviously it's much tougher in the federal government where you don't have as many bonus systems, but there are SES uh, bonuses given based on various performance factor, and this could be looked at perhaps as one element of the incentive for managers to save money in terms of making their workforce more productive, and that may incent them to promote more telecommuting. And I would think from a parking perspective and some of these problems around some of the buildings where you have it up, uh, you know, it can help on all of those kinds of things. Uh, Mr. Stratton and then Mr. Milkovich. Yeah, I, I was just, I just want to echo what Harris said. I mean, I, I think if, if, you, if you look at Siemens as a model, IBM, by the way, is also another good model. What drove both these companies was cost. We were under intense competitive pressure, and we had to reduce our expenses, and b because it's difficult to ask managers to change, okay. it's difficult to manage in a distributed environment. It takes different skills. You have to do different things. So, if you know the, the one thing that, that you could do, I think, to get it really uh, uh, widespread within the federal government, and then I think it has a rip ripple effect into the pri private sector, is you you just simply tell them that they have to reduce their real estate expenses, and the rest will follow. But people don't change unless they have to. Uh, let me let me submit. Uh, obviously, we've talked about the backbone being cultural, technological, uh, you know, the kind of social benefits, if you will. I think from the private sector, uh, Mr. Stratton is on that there has to be an underlying economic benefit. It has to be a reduction in space. It has to be a better efficiency on occupancy levels and use of space. I think that. Uh, I think the federal government is in an enviable position in the sense that you control a substantial amount of leasehold interest, so you have a lot of room to make those type of moves. Uh, I'm not sure I'm correct on this, so it's almost uh, a statement in the way it formed in a question, and that is if uh, a particular department is able to reduce its real estate costs, if there is a way that they could see that benefit to their department it be recorded or, rec or somehow recognized for that department, I think you would see a stronger shift toward teleworking. Okay. Uh, let me ask, sure, Ms. Jenkins. Um, I, all the things that were stated I think are important incentives, and I think the Federal Railroad Administration is a good example to follow relative to the space reduction and uh, the incentive to encourage um, managers to allow more employees to telecommute. In addition to what's been said, and. It, sort of follows upon what's been said is, is that the, it seems to me the most important and critical incentive is, is, is tying telecommuting to the business needs of an organization. And that would also include the human capital challenges that managers are feeling right now with a potential um, huge numbers of employees about to retire that 
utilizing telework as a retention strategy, utilizing telework as a recruitment tool to gain the best and the brightest um, college graduates into the uh, public service. Um, are real incentives for managers, and that's what it is that we're trying to do at OPM, is trying to get that word out and really tie the impact of telecommuting to the business of an organization. It just seems right now we're getting the worst of all worlds. We're not, um, we're not getting any office space reduction from this plan yet because we just don't have the penetration in the workforce that we ought to have. And uh, since we don't get, and yet we are spending money for these telecommuting centers. So it's, ended up, it's, it's really a net cost right now. And, and the reaction we tend to get is, geez, well, I guess we have to do it. Congress wants us to do it. And we really don't understand uh, what it can do for our workforce and for other things. But when you listen to Siemens and you listen to Carr and you listen to IBM and you listen to AT&T and some of these private companies and how it is helping them in their business plan, you know, you feel like you ought to do a seminar with some of your managers and show them what the possibilities are. Yes, and that's exactly what we intend to do. There's really good data out. Um, AT&T particularly um, has done a cost-benefit analysis relative to the impact of telecommuting right. on productivity, um, and we plan to, to push that information out. The Internal Revenue Service, an aspect of the Internal Revenue Service, has done a cost-benefit analysis, which we intend to help them market. It's wonderful to talk about um, the money that can be saved when you don't have to recruit for individuals that leave your organization. Um, it's estimated between 93 and 150 percent of annual salary is spent on recruiting. And, and we need to translate that into uh, dollar figures for federal agencies. So that's something that we're plan to, planning to do, not only in our Octo October leadership conference, but also in our January conference, where we really get to the managers and the supervisors. OK, sure. Yeah, Mr. Just Good. to make one point, I, uh, on the space reduction, I don't want to uh, leave the impression that uh, this is a space reduction program. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, interaction with the private sector. And in some companies, it may result in space reduction. In others, it may not redu uh, result in space reduction at all. But it may result in uh, getting the job done better. It may result in a uh, much lower turnover rate, the ability to attract and retain uh, good employees. So the, the whole thing uh, from my, my perspective is it's about the business. How do you best get the business done? How do you uh, offer the uh, associates or employees the best range of a combination of working in the office, working at home, working in the field, and linking that all together with the technology? And that calls for a lot of careful planning, a lot of thinking, and a lot, a lot of uh, willingness to make those options available. Well, you get a, there are a lot of benefits, and I, I think, as you say, you don't um, employ this with one thing in mind. But clearly, on recruiting and retention, uh, we got had some specific examples in the testimony today about people who you can get into the business and you can retain them because they can spend more time at home and with their families and do other things. Uh, that is something with the federal government spending as much money as it does recruiting and retaining people uh, that's a plus. Um, also, you, you will get some space reduction, obviously, if you, uh, with your workforce. And we see you, you walk through Siemens and you see it. Um, third, traffic reduction. This helps people who aren't to telecommuting, too, by getting a few cars off the road. It's a lot cheaper, I think, over the long term to move cars off the road than it is building a new highways. That's a byproduct. It's not the reason we're doing this, but it can be a significant byproduct. And, and also, on very bad days, you may get off down in Dale City in my uh, district or out in uh, 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 Reston or out in West Virginia, see what the traffic is like and say, gee, this, this could be a long day today, and they can telecommute on that given day. Uh, and fourth is, is something we haven't talked enough about, but it was mentioned in the testimony today, and that is productivity increase. That the fact of the matter are that people that, t that telecommute are working after their 40-hour weeks are working more hours at home than employees who don't telecommute. Uh, it just start, it's, it's, a, it's a cultural change, and they can, their job can become part of their life this way, but not interfere with the other parts of their life. And uh, so uh, those seem to me to be uh, really significant benefits. i got more questions, but let me ask uh, my uh, friend, Mr. Moran, if he'd like to ask uh, any questions at this point. Thank you, Tom. Uh, I, and I appreciate you holding this hearing, Mr. Chairman. And for all of the reasons that you just listed, it's imperative that we find the obstacles to expansion of telecommuting and, uh, and then find ways to address those, to overcome those. And so I would like to bring up two such potential barriers. 
Uh, and first of all, in terms of the federal government, uh, I want to ask Mr. Bibb and Ms. Jenkins to comment on the security aspect. Because in Northern Virginia, for example, the largest federal employer by far is the Department of Defense. And yet my sense is that the telecommuting uh, that goes on within Defense Department is pretty limited. And my, I would guess that if we push them, the first thing they'd come up with is security. We can't compromise the data that our employees are dealing with. And, uh, and then, of course, normally we would be intimidated into, or at least in, inhibited from uh, pursuing that any further. Uh, I would like to, uh, for you to address that aspect of the security of information that is dealt with when you are using home computers. Obviously, we've had some some very public examples of um, the uh, uh, some of our uh, chief executives and in intelligence agencies, for example, uh, compromising intelligence that they were uh, that um, they had available through their home computers, and uh, and that became a problem. Uh, so I'd like to see what you um, how you address that. And let me just give an opportunity for the private sector people to think about the second thing, which is the tax code and how the tax code is related to telecommuting, uh, both the tax advantages potentially for individuals, but also some of the complications. For example, if there are two state income tax regimes that you might have to deal with if you're telecommuting. So I just want to get you prepared for that. And, and uh, Mr. Bibb and Ms. Jenkins. Well, certainly within the Defense Department, I agree that the security issue is the, is the biggest uh, obstacle there at 0.5% uh, of the workforce telecommuting right now, or as of April, um, that is a huge obstacle to overcome. Uh, some of the things that we are doing in OPM uh, to help overcome the, um, the government-wide obstacle to security is, to, is working with the Federal CIO Council and the Security Committee to come up with some ideas that will help us to help agencies such as defense overcome this uh, concern of theirs. We also already have um, a number of uh, pieces of guidance that we have uh, provided to the agencies to help them to overcome some of the uh, security concerns that they have. Uh, such as making sure that they have the proper firewall protection and virus updates. And simple things like if your computer is, is home, make, it sh make sure it's secure and away from your children so that there aren't any accidents that might occur um, while, the, while the computer I is at home. Those simple things uh, we're publicizing to the agencies to think about. And uh, coupled with that is that when agencies uh, plan their telecommuting programs, they must include a variety of stakeholders um, and individuals within the organization to help plan the program. And one of the most important people uh, are the security officials and to identify how it is that they can overcome some of the security obstacles that, uh, and, and to prevent problems. Um, so we realize that particularly for the Defense Department, um, their culture is such that they are more concerned about the security issue than perhaps some other agencies, and we need to work perhaps personally with them uh, to help them overcome some of their obstacles. That uh, you began uh, in your response by noting that only one half of one percent of the largest agency in the federal government has any telecommuting uh, going yes, on. Sir. Yeah, that's a lot pretty, of work to do. Yeah. I wonder if it isn't to some extent a generational thing, too, in terms of management wanting hands-on control over employees. But, um, uh, Mr. Bibb, unless you have something to ask, add to Ms. Jenkins' very comprehensive and, and very good uh, response, informative response, uh, let me ask Mr. Miller about the tax implications of telecommuting in the private sector. I think that we have to make a bit of a distinction here because telecommuting frequently blends together two concepts. There's telecommuting from home and there's telecommuting from telecenters, which are controlled by the government in one way or another, either directly or through contracting with a, with a private vendor. And it seems to me that even in the most severe security concerns of the Defense Department, at least many of these telecenters can be just as secure 
in terms of protecting the information technology, the data, et cetera, as they are if they were coming into the Pentagon or some other Defense Department building that's immediately proximate to the Defense Department. So it seems to me that is a bit of a, can be a bit of a bogus issue. If, if the issue really is legitimately concerned about security and we don't want people taking things home, nevertheless, they still may be able to work at a telecenter in Dale City or some other relatively remote location. And so I, we, need to, we need to make that distinction, I think, is very important. I, I appreciate uh, that, Mr. Miller. Uh, but uh, of course, these telecenters in the long run are going to be on, only a marginal amount, I suspect, of the telecom. Most telecommuting is going to take place at the home if it's really effective, because to get to a right. telecenter that has a, a sufficient critical mass of employees and, and, and uh, resource uh, equipment supplies and so on uh, it, it's you, you have a transportation hassle there anyways I mean if you're coming from uh, you know be uh, uh, south of Springfield and trying to get into the Springfield mixing bowl where we have a telecenter you that's uh, yeah they uh, we defeated the purpose in large part but I do think there's a security issue with home computers where the individual is using that computer for personal use as well. And when you can attach cookies on your, on banner ads and so on, it's, uh, it seems to me it's, a pre it's pretty easy to, to then access information that is being used for work. I, I mean, it may be my ignorance, but I, I don't know how you build up sufficient firewalls to prevent uh, to, to separate your personal usage and official usage? Actually, it's not. I mean, it's, the technology is there, and the technology has been developed to a large extent for exactly the reason that telecommuting has become so popular in the private sector. And the private sector is no less worried than the public sector is about data being compromised when it's used by telecommuters. The trick is not that the whether the technology exists or not. The technology does exist. The trick is to make sure people implement it. As you know, part of the problem is that people don't always update their technology, they don't always make sure that they have the, the latest antivirus software, they don't make sure that their firewalls are current. And so part of the, the, the big challenge here is, again, a management challenge. It's one thing to tell people that the technology is available, which means that people can't come in through remote locations and access databases if they do A, B, and C. It's another thing to make sure they do A, B, and C. And that is, uh, there's a concomitant, it's not just the employee's response, it's the employer's responsibility Absolutely. to instruct them. Fortunately, there are monitoring systems, there are technologies available and companies that specialize in monitoring to make sure that both central locations and remote locations are following the procedure. So, so you do have to, in a sense, put another layer of protection on. You'd have to have some kind of monitoring system to make sure that the telecommuter would have his or her computer monitored, and if the monitoring service found out that they hadn't updated their firewall or hadn't updated their software, whatever was necessary to protect the, tech, the information technology, then basically you have to cut that that telecommuter off until he or she had updated that technology to the appropriate levels of security. But I, d I don't think the vulnerabilities are quite as high as you might be imagining if the corporation or the government do everything possible to use the latest technology that's out there. Yeah. Well, invariably, if there's a will, there's a way, although I suspect that this is one area where our defense and intelligence agencies are going to find an easy excuse right. not to do anything. On, on the tax issue, I certainly agree with you, Mr. Chairman, and, and uh, I know, noticed that the GAO mentioned, uh, Mr. Moran rather, mentioned this in his testimony also, that this whole tax liability and multi-state jurisdiction issues, as you know, we have 7,500 approximately taxing jurisdictions. It's particularly a challenge for small businesses um, because they are not used to having to pay employees in all types of jurisdictions. They're used to, in most cases, just having employees in, in one jurisdiction. Also, some states, um, are now trying to use the presence of employees as an excuse to set up what's so-called nexus, which, as you know, is a big issue in terms of interstate taxation. So it is something that is potentially going to become a problem as more and more small businesses. Most large businesses, frequently, they, they already have employees in multiple jurisdictions, so it's a pain, but it's a pain they're used to dealing with. But when you're talking about a small business and trying to incentivize them, the, the tax, multiple taxing issue can be a problem. Well, a, a, a clever business, or at least a business with clever accountants, could uh, easily 
locate there if it's a business that buys supplies and equipment and so on online they can simply locate their employees in those jurisdictions that have the lowest sales tax regime and and uh, and max maximize the opportunity through telecommuting but uh, was there did you want to add something mr strain I, I don't really have much to add the only thing i'd say is that uh, you know, if, if you take the de Defense Department, I mean, when these guys are on the battlefield or doing, you know, out doing practice sessions, they're communicating, they're teleworking. I mean, y you have a very small subset, or not small, but you have a subset of their employees that have very, very secure information. They clearly should be in a secure environment, but you have a whole other subset that, uh, you know, they're ordering supplies or whatever it is. It just, it just doesn't matter. Uh, so uh, I as it relates to us, my, my view would be for security, you know, there's a you know janitors come in and clean things at night, and stuff's not locked up, or PCs aren't turned off. Um, I, you know, I, you're probably more secure at home. I don't know what a three-year-old's going to do with you know confidential semen software information, right? So I'm, I don't think it's a big issue. I think it's a big uh, excuse, to be honest. Now, as it relates to the government, I mean, and the taxation, for us it has not been a problem. I think the uh, companies gaming the system. Uh, as, you, as you stated, is it needs to be thought through, and I think you have to make sure that the companies are not in a, a position, and employees are not in a position when they're paying taxes to multiple states. I think that uh, the Wolf idea of a tax incentive to jumpstart this thing is a good idea. Um, I, I think a better idea, though, is to have the government take a leadership role at the senior levels, and uh, I, and I think with all the government agencies, you just say that you know over a certain period of time, you got to have 10 percent less real estate, and I guarantee you, you will and uh, you'll probably have better results and everything else. Um, yes, about other private se se sector issues, you just have to make sure that the laws for you know, liability, privacy, and, uh, and performance issues uh, don't penalize the companies. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the, you know, teleworking is, a, is not a right, and, and I've had that problem uh, in my own department where we actually had a secretary who teleworked, circumstances changed, and she had to come back in. And so needless to say, she got upset. So m my point is, is that in the performance things, you can have the exact same job and two different people, and that job can, one of those people can telework and one of them can't. And there's a lot of factors that come into it, whether they have small kids at home, uh, whether how responsible they are, what their performance is. So that's, that's an area that I'm probably the most nervous about being penalized as an employer because it becomes a, you know, a fairness issue, uh, so for example. But it really comes down to, can the job telework and, and is their performance allow them to telework. Thank you. Uh, and, uh, oh, uh, I'll, I'll just add real quickly on the two jurisdictional tax is issue. I think it hits at the heart of uh, recruitment and retention. It could potentially, depending on the company, hit at the heart of uh, recruitment and retention. And I think private sector companies today are starting to view teleworking as part of a standard offering, much like a 401k plan or medical benefits. Mm -hmm. Many people are asking about teleworking today. Let me digress for one quick second just to say that when I talk about space efficiencies, it's not always as if the glass is half empty. I also think that teleworking is a very potent tool to manage your growth. As agencies grow that can't acquire the space fast enough, teleworking is an excellent tool to facilitate the growth. It's a very good point. I, I didn't ask anything of GAO because your report is so extensive, comprehensive. Uh, uh, you've done a good job at looking at all the problems. May I make an observation anyway? Sure. <laughs> um, I guess this goes about, you know, we've been talking, and it's not on the tax issue so much as the uh, data security issue that we've been seeming to come back to uh, several times during, during the hearings. I'm just, uh, to me, that whole, that whole discussion, is it an issue? isn't it an issue, uh, go, uh, is, is a great illustration of what uh, I think uh, Representative Morello was talking about at the beginning, and that, that uh, basically had to do with, you know, we really got to get a, a really good handle on uh, the extent to which these uh, management obstacles that we've talked about uh, as GAO and as a group today exist in each individual uh, federal agency. And uh, I think that should be a, that, sh that should be uh, a prime action area for OPM, basically. Sure. Thank you very much. And Chairman Davis, thank you again for having this hearing and for the generous time you allotted for the questions and responses. Thank you. I've got a couple questions to some. First of all, on the GSA, you have gotten beyond, I think, to some extent, the manager's um, fear of letting employees work outside the workplace. 
But that seems to be the major paradigm that we've got to move is that manage, how do you manage if you can't see the people? Uh, it seems to me that's our biggest obstacle of managerial in the federal. Have you gotten beyond it? Uh, what do we need to do to change that? We have seen, uh, you know, from the testimony in the private sector, how they have moved well beyond that and are being actually more productive. Well, I think we, we haven't totally gotten by, beyond it. Okay. There's still plenty of supervisors who uh, have some distrust. But yes, our numbers are good, and it has been a combination of things. One uh, is our continued emphasis that this is a way of getting the work done that it makes sense for both the supervisor and, and the employee. If it does make sense, then there ought to be teleworking. Second way is to uh, continue to discuss with our supervisors that you measure the work the same way you measure the work when they're in the office. You set performance targets and they're hit or they're not. And if they're not, then you have the same performance discussion. In my own case, half of my uh, associates telework. And uh, they are held to the same standards as any others. So that that is the basic. Uh, a way you get, you, you are able to monitor performance. I think the other piece, and, and to have good sound policies in place, the other piece is cultural. And it does in part come from the top with the recognition that um, this is a viable way to work. It will be supported. And uh, where it makes sense, we'll, we'll go after it. So it's, it is a combination of having the right policies in place, uh, common sense approach, and top management support. OK. Uh, I think that's all the questions. Let me just ask OPM the tracking system that we're working on, uh, imperfect at this point. What are we doing to try to improve it and well, get a good baseline? Yes, the tracking system that we're working on government-wide is uh, under the auspices of the Human Resource Data Network, which is a um, system that will streamline and improve re reporting and um, eliminate pa paper records uh, within human resource offices. So we have already established data elements that can be included in either the um, government's payroll or personnel systems that would be able to track the number of teleworkers. We won't be able to get that system in place um, as quickly as we would like, um, hopefully in O2, but um, I'm not sure at this point that it will happen in O2. Meanwhile, we are providing agencies with uh, some guidance, and many of them are um, taking our guidance. For, the, for example, the Defense Department has uh, decided that one of the ways that it's going to help with its tracking system is to uh, require all telecommuters to be on agreements, even their ad hoc episodic telecommuters that will help them to better track. Other agencies are doing something similar. And there are even other agencies that requ are requiring their um, various departments to uh, report to them monthly so that they can get used to the fact that they're going to have to be reporting their teleworkers on a regular basis and to help them to um, establish and refine their current tracking system. So it, it is um, an issue that we are addressing government-wide, but we have also seen significant progress within the agencies because they fully understand that uh, there is a requirement to report to OPM on their progress, and they are making strides in, uh, in establishing and refining their tracking systems. Okay, thank you. Um, let me just ask one other question. Uh, is there any union issues on this where you have to renegotiate uh, to try to do this kind of thing? Any, any prohibitions under agreements anybody's aware of? Um, what's required under the Federal Labor Man Management Relations Statute is that um, there is an obligation uh, by federal agencies to negotiate telework with their um, employee unions, things like telework. Um, and we know that agencies are doing that. And we, one of my other jobs at, at OPM, besides the work-life programs, is the government-wide labor and management relations program. And we have brought the labor relations directors together just last uh, month to go over the uh, requirements of negotiating um, contracts and providing sample uh, bargaining language to the agencies. OK. Thank you, Mary. Anything else anyone want to add? Well, let me thank all of you. Uh, before we close, I just want to, again, thank everybody for attending the subcommittee hearing today. I want to particularly thank the witnesses, uh, Congressman Turner, who had to leave earlier, uh, Representative Moran and Norton, and on my side, uh, Mr. Wolf, who couldn't be here but has been such a leader in this element, and of course, Mrs. Capito and, and Mrs. Morella, who are here, uh, and thank them for participating as well. I want to also thank my staff for, for organizing this. I think it's been very productive. Uh, I would enter into the record the briefing memo distributed to subcommittee members. We'll hold the record open for two weeks from to date for anyone who might want to forward a, a further thought on this or supplement your remarks. And I thank you again, and these proceedings are closed.
For more information on the work that Congress is doing this session, visit the new section of our website, Capital Spotlight. It's produced by C-SPAN.